That's good. Yeah. Um, so and then the crash you say you have to punch the air, right? Mm -hmm. Punch right. all the air. Is there? So you say you're saying there's still is air resistance after this storm, right? Yes. Okay. You have to punch through all these waves that have built up. So basically, the wave is built up and built up. Like, okay, so uh, imagine you're swimming, because you swim. If you go splash, and then you swim forward and go splash, and swim forward and go splash, um, eventually, if you caught up to your waves, you can make a splash, and the waves get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. So I do that with a, with a pool float. I go basically go sploosh. And then if you get the right frequency, you go sploosh, sploosh, sploosh. And eventually, you're splooshing, and the wave gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and they start going over the edge, and then everybody yells at you. Uh, that, all right, that makes sense. Okay. So, so uh, this is what this is called. This is called a mock cone. Mock means uh, named after Ernest Mach. Um, basically, mock. the idea is a mock cone is um, the piling up of the waves as the aircraft flies faster than the speed of sound. Okay. Oh. Yes. So the more waves there is, does that mean there's more resistance? Um, not necessarily. Okay. Realize the waves are constantly being produced. Okay. So, so it's kind of two questions. First question is it looks like the waves are still attached to the aircraft, obviously, because it's still making sound. Mm -hmm. So would it be impossible to speed up like way faster and just get away from those waves completely? Or since the plane's still making sound, it'll always be attached to the aircraft. You're always dragging it behind you. Okay. Now, this cone gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you get faster and faster. The cone gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but it also gets more and more intense. So, uh, yeah, you, you're always dragging behind you. So these are pressure, okay, so that's the SR-71, um, the fastest military, air, fastest production military aircraft. It was 3.5, Mach, Mach 3.5. There's There are faster aircraft, but they're almost considered space planes because they have to be really, really high. Anyway, so, um, so that's kind of cool, SR-71. Um, these are, these are waves of compression and rarefaction. Compression and rarefaction. Compression and rarefaction. Bottom right. That's a boil. Yep. And this is cavitation. This is a basically a hard vacuum created behind the uh, behind the bullet. You don't want that. You don't want that in any situation. Which is why the back of the Prius is rounded, so there's no cavitation behind it. Because the cavitation will pull the bullet back. Basically, this is a hard vacuum that wants to pull the bullet back. Ideally, the bullet would be completely football shaped. Uh, the problem with making it football shaped is um, it's hard to get the, the hot gases to push it out of the barrel. So if you look for a shape that balances that cavitation, but also allows hot gases to push it out of the barrel. If it was here, you'd get, if it was totally flat or concave on the inside, like whoop, then you'd get a, uh, a really efficient push when the hot gases expand out of the barrel. But then you'd have massive concavity or massive, uh, yeah, you'd have massive air resistance behind it pulling the bullet back. Yeah? Um, what is Mach 3 in like about 10 meters per second? Uh, what is the light? What is Mach 3 in like meters per second? Um, meters per second, so multiply <laughs> 430, yeah, 340. Multiply 340 by 3, so, so around 1,300. Yeah. Okay. So, speed of sound, if you, know, if you want to know it, so miles per hour is about 700. That makes kilometers per hour Thousand, about. All right. So uh, yeah. But so now we're gonna switch gears. Oh, we spent way more time on that than I wanted. We're gonna switch gears. Um, so musical instruments. When you blow into a whistle, and my whistle is back here. My whistle. Gotta have a whistle. When you blow into whistles, you're causing the air inside the whistle to get pushed together. So this is a slide whistle with a slide removed. Oriental training, I think they're like 50 cents. So this is a slide whistle with a slide removed, and when you use it, you want to take some alcohol and wipe it off because you never know what's in someone's mouth. But with that whole Winnie the Flu thing going around, um, so that's a, that I have it open right here. So this is a whistle, and this is causing the air to get to basically get vibrated in here, and it's in this column, and it's open on the end. Watch what happens when I close the end. You're playing a recorder. Hey. Yeah, same thing you do with a clarinet or a flute. You open and close holes so you change how big the vibrating air column is. Cool, huh? So 
So what's more dense, my fingertip or vibrating air? Your fingertip. My fingertip. What is more dense, vibrating air or stale air? Stale air. No, vibrating. Vibrating air. Can we do this again? Did it push together? So vibrating air is more dense than stale air. So what I have here, when I put my finger over the end, is a closed pipe. That's a closed pipe. A closed pipe has an antinode where the energy is going in and a node where the energy is stopped. If you want to make a device that is a closed pipe, if you want to make a device to produce a specific wavelength, you need to make that device four times the distance, sorry, sorry one fourth the wavelength you want. Okay, so another way, to look, another way to look at this is L equals one fourth lambda. So if you want to make a device for a specific wavelength, then you need to make that device, it's going to be a closed pipe, one fourth the wavelength you want. Okay, that's a closed pipe. Now if I open my finger, that's an open pipe. If you want to make an open pipe instrument, then you need to make the instrument one half the length of the wavelength you want. So again, you can rewrite this as L equals one half lambda. So with an open pipe, you have an anti-node on both ends with a node in the middle. Okay. Does this idea make sense? Now a string uses the same formula as an open pipe. But a string, we've actually looked at strings before, a string has a node on either end because a string is fixed. So a string has a node on either end and an anti-node in the middle. But the formula is the same. In both cases, you get a half a wave inside the device. Can you kind of see that if this is an anti-node, this is a node, can you see that that is a half a wave? So for those who have good visual acuity and good imagination, they can see that, all right, that's a half a wave. To get an entire wave, you need a node, node, node with two antinodes. Well, here we have node, antinode, anti half an antinode, half an antinode. Yeah. So this is half a wave, this is half a wave. In both cases, both open pipes and strings, you see half a wave. So if you want to make an instrument that produces an entire wave, you only need to make that instrument half the size of the wavelength you want. On the other hand, something interesting happens with closed pipes. With closed pipes, you have an anti-node and a node, so with a closed pipe, you only see a fourth of the wave. So if you want to make a closed pipe instrument, you only need to make a closed pipe instrument one fourth the size of the wave you want. Make sense? So how come there aren't a lot of closed pipe instruments? How come most instruments are open on one end? Like a saxophone or a clarinet or a flute? Well, you can make it. You can make a flute half the size. You can, instead of making it half the size of the, of the instrument, you can make it a quarter. How come we don't use a lot of closed pipes? A, a, a sports whistle is a closed pipe. It only makes one frequency, right? No, you can still put the. the buttons. Yeah, they're not very loud. Yeah, closed pipes. Closed pipe instruments tend to uh, make tend to basically collapse a lot of their waves and are just simply not as loud. So a flute is uh, is an open pipe. You can put your thumb over the end of the flute. It's going to change the pitch, but it's not going to be nearly as loud. So, so anybody play the flute in here? Anybody, any flautists? Okay. So, so Chloe's going to bring in her flute. You can go to Chloe's house and she's playing her flute. And when she's playing, it, just put your thumb over the end. Like, <laughs> like hey, it's not nearly as loud. The pitch went up. So there we go. All right. Harmonics. Again, strings. This harmonics works for closed pipes, open pipes, we usually function, we usually work with them with strings. So the natural frequency or the first harmonic, the fundamental harmonic, has a node on either end and an antinode in the middle. The second harmonic is what you get when you have the wave or triple the frequency, or sorry, double the frequency. So if you double the frequency or half the wavelength, you get what's called the first overtone. 
called the second harmonic. Yeah. The second harmonic is the first overtone. The fundamental harmonic is the longest weight you have in there. So this is You can build them all on the same instrument. You just need to open the right pipes. The second overtone is called the third harmonic, or the third harmonic is called the second overtone. Okay. And then the fourth harmonic, which is the third overtone, musicians call this the perfect fourth. I'm not a musician, so somebody just told me, that's called the perfect fourth. So I was like, all right, I'll write it down. So for the musicians. Maybe one day I'll learn, I'll learn to play an instrument. Right now I just play the stereo. <laughs> so anyway, so that's harmonics. So if uh, in a typical a typical question would be, this instrument has a fundamental frequency of 600 hertz. What is the frequency of the first harmonic? What is the frequency of the first harmonic? If it's the fundamental frequency is 600, what's the first harmonic? 600. What is the second harmonic? <laughs> Six hundred is the first harmonic, the fundamental frequency. The second harmonic would be twelve hundred. The third harmonic would be eighteen hundred. The fourth harmonic would be twenty-four hundred. See how that works? So if the first wavelength, the fundamental frequency, had a wavelength of one meter, the second harmonic, the first first harmonic, has a wavelength of one meter. The second harmonic would have a wavelength of If frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. down. So if the fundamental frequency has a wavelength of one meter, the first harmonic, wavelength of one meter, the second harmonic has a wavelength of one half a meter. And the third harmonic would be one fourth. And the fourth harmonic would be one eighth. See how that works? Okay. Assuming the vibrating air doesn't change, and it doesn't, then uh, the harmonics are simply multiples of the frequency, halves of the wavelength. Can you see that the wavelength halved here, but the yeah. frequency doubled? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, beats and harmonics. So here we go, this is kind of fun. <laughs> okay. I found one of those. Yeah, found it in the back. their skin. It's, it's like on them constantly. Okay. So here we those over there. It sounds slightly different. What are you hearing? You're hearing and you're hearing the put them together. What are you hearing? You're hearing bong, and you're hearing bong. Are you hearing something else? What are you hearing? Uh, what's it called? Oh. Constructive. Like okay, adding. so this one, it makes it really, really significant. Okay, ready? All right. Okay, now together. Yeah, constructive. They're adding to your That, whoa, 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 whoa. Here, this one was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But the whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's called a beat frequency. Mm -hmm. It's what you get when waves constructively and destructively interfere. And the beat frequency, for, uh, to simplify the math, is simply the difference in the frequencies of the two waves. So what is the beat frequency when two tones are played, one at 340 and one at 400? It's 20. So let me show you visually what that's going to look like. It's really kind of neat. Uh, this is a really neat animation that unfortunately we don't have time for. <laughs> but uh, I do want to show you graphically what a beat looks like. So let's go to the next page. So this is kind of like, they're slightly different. Oh, maybe we can have time for it. Hey, in a bag, 
Ain't nobody get up. So they're slightly different, but in a little bit they're gonna hit at the same time. There. That they're completely in phase at one point, and in a little bit they're gonna be completely out of phase. Like right now. Right there. And if you were to graph it, it would look like this. So they're just, if you were to graph the pressure versus time, you're gonna see this. This wave looks a lot like this wave. But if you add the two waves with interference, you get that. Does this kind of look like a third wave? Yeah. yeah. So that's what you get. You get a third wave that looks like that. This is called a beat. And if you like math, you're going to love this next slide. Yeah, there you go. Oh, oops, back up. So, ah. That's what it looks like. If the first one has the formula a sine omega t, and the second one is a sine omega 2t, then the b frequency has the sine y plus y2 equals a2 cosine omega 1 minus omega 2 over t. Too much yeah, kind of cool, huh? I know, I know how much you guys love trig, but we simply don't have time to go over all these, these uh, trig Oh, boy, what a Yay. I know. Yes. Right now, I was really looking forward to the hot box. Okay. I think we're done. Okay, I'm gonna skip the practice because I want to finish the lecture. All right, last thing. This is one of those things that I think you should know because people say I want to learn physics, but I also want to learn about the human body. All right, so uh, the major parts of the ear. Hopefully, uh, all of you have at least one. Some of you even have two. So the outer ear acts like a funnel, and what happens is when you hear sound. The sound vibrates the air. That vibrating air travels through your ear hole and into your eardrum. Your eardrum vibrates sympathetically to the waves that it's catching. Okay. If you've ever like, if you've ever been um, at, at church or at a concert and somebody plays a bass guitar and the snare drum starts vibrating. Yeah, so sometimes that happens. So, like in the band room, sometimes someone will play some music and the drums will start vibrating because those big bladders on top, the big drum heads, look, they, they basically function like an eardrum. That's why they call it an eardrum. So the eardrum vibrates sympathetically, about the same frequency as the waves coming in. The eardrum causes the anvil to move, which hits the hammer. Now, in World of Warcraft, the hammer hits the anvil, but in your ear, the anvil hits the hammer. I don't know. The hammer, the hammer vibrates the cochlea, and the cochlea has these tiny little fibers that vibrate, and they produce electrical signals that your brain detects as sound. And over time, you realize, like, that sound is mommy's voice. That sound is daddy's voice. That, sound that, is that arrangement of vibrations is daddy's voice. That arrangement of vibrations is a car engine. Yeah. So, my question is, if someone were to have cauliflower ear, how would that affect it? Like, would that affect how the sound travels into their ear? Probably. Yeah. The, the, the cartilage and the bone, the, the entire, okay, so first of all, the entire makeup of your skull determines your voice. So if you have plastic surgery, your voice will actually change. Just like if somebody breaks your nose, you're kind of on like this. Yeah, because your nose isn't occupying the air as moving as well. So um, you're saying you get a lower voice. So you can get a lower voice by having plastic surgery. Dead. Yeah, your so your entire skull is like the body of an acoustic guitar. Your entire face is vibrating when you talk. Uh, so okay, so this is kind of cool. I think I think it's kind of cool. Maybe you don't, but um, there's one thing I want to talk about. Lastly, anyone ever got out of a concert and everything sounded really really quiet? Yeah. Yeah, that's because the uh, hammer can move up and down on the anvil. So the anvil is basically doing this. And the hammer is stuck to the anvil, and it's moving like this. But there's a little muscle that can pull the hammer down the anvil so it doesn't move as much. So this is you right now. Okay? This is you in a concert. So you're still getting a lot of energy, but your hammer moves down to keep your cochlea from being damaged. That's why when you get out of a concert, you're like, everything's really quiet. Am I deaf? 
Probably not. Maybe a little bit. But this is because your hammer is moved down, it's not moved back yet. Yeah. So what happens when you get older? No. As you get older, your eardrum and the parts inside become less and less elastic. So first of all, the eardrum can't vibrate at high frequencies, which is why uh, like Strachan and I can't hear the 1500 hertz beat, you know, buzzing, uh, because we're older and our eardrum is not as elastic as it once was. And then all our parts don't function as fast either. What if? Yeah. What if it's because there's a buildup of uh, earwax? They just don't clean it. It's that would <laughs> certainly not help, but that's a temporary <laughs> issue. Hey, I've seen old people like that. They're like, my hearing aids don't work quite like they used to. <laughs> but it's like, go to a doctor and flush out some of that ear gun. Yeah. All right. So uh, free, humans basically hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Anything higher than 20,000 hertz is called ultrasonic. Ooh, that's a word you need to know. Anything higher over 20,000 hertz is called ultrasonic, basically above human hearing. Practically speaking, when we say 20,000 hertz, we're talking about like toddlers. You guys are probably sporting around 16 or 17,000. I'm probably at around 14 or 15,000. So highest you can do 20,000, or like a Tibetan monk that lives his life in silence. He can probably hear up near 20,000. Anything below 20 hertz is called infrasonic. Infrasonic, literally below sounds or below sounds we can hear. And again, this is generous. You probably can't hear anything south of 40. Okay. Um, some people, can, you can certainly feel it, ugh, all the vibrations, but you probably can't hear it. Um, you probably know that dogs can hear better than we can. They can hear up near 45,000. I have an electric dog whistle. It's got two little speakers, and it's like you, you aim it at the dog, and the dog's like, hey, what is that? I can't hear it, but the dog can. <laughs> well, you bet. Well, you know, old dog whistles used to be about that big, and pew, you know, like dog be like. Dogs do be like. This big. <laughs> okay. What about cats? Better or worse than dogs? We're probably better. I oh, guarantee worse. Those They're poor better. cats, they can hear upwards of eighty thousand hertz. Wow. So when a when a fly flies by, a cat knows about it. Okay. Yeah. So you can't sneak up. Even on if a cat. it's not like you know, you can sometimes hear. Um, 